welcome everybody to the Migrating to ArcGIS Pro uh, presentation this morning. Uh, impressed by the, the turnout. Uh, how many of y'all have at least opened Pro once? Wow, good number y'all. That, that's impressive. I think that's the largest group I've ever seen. So what I, I hope to, to do uh, today in talking about Pro is go over some basics. We'll talk about some of the installation requirements, uh, some of the changes you can expect from ArcMap, uh, give you some recommendations on hardware, uh, whatnot, and then I'll dive into some, some live demo stuff. So when you see it crash, you'll know that that's, well, what it does. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so for those that don't know me, I, I'm Trip Corbin. I'm the CEO of EGIS Associates, a company I started back in 2010 as a GIS consulting firm based out of Metro Atlanta, but I come up here to Raleigh a good bit and teach classes out at NC State through ITRI. I have literally written the book on ArcGIS Pro. I have two books out on it. Uh, my first book, Learning ArcGIS Pro, actually came out before Esri had any books out on the software. Uh, which is both good and bad, because now it means that book is quite old, and my publisher is being real anal about me updating it. Uh, but then I had one I released, uh, I think last year or whatever, that's uh, more uh, more current, uh, ArcGIS Pro Cookbook. So I've had the pleasure, if you want to call it that, of working with ArcGIS Pro since it was still in beta, before it was even out released out to all of y'all to, to play with, uh, mash your teeth over and generally go, what in the world was Jack's thinking? But uh, it, it's gotten a whole lot better since it first came out. And I like to equate it to when ARC uh, GIS came out. How many of y'all went through that whole transition from ARC Info and ARC View into uh, ARC, ARC GIS? Yeah, a good number of y'all. And I remember at that time, we were all going, oh my God, why, have, why is Esri doing this to us? What's going on? Why can't I have multiple layouts anymore? Where's my command line? Why can't I use my AMLs? What about all my avenue scripts? What are you doing? This, and it crashed all the time. Right? You, you open it up, it would crash. <laughs> you wouldn't even have to necessarily open it. you just think about it and you'd crash, right? <laughs> um, but now, as we're moving into Arc Pro, we're going through that same transition. And it's funny, I hear people out there going, don't take my Arc Map away. You'll take my Arc Map out of my cold, dead hands. It's like, hold it, T 20 years ago, we were saying this was the worst thing that ever came out. And now, you don't want to let it go. Uh, but it, it's part of change, right? There's a lot that Arc Map uh, cannot do going forward. It, it's built on an architecture that is 20 years old. For those that may not remember, ArcMap came out in 1999. Yeah, we're, we're a long, long time since then, and a lot of technology has changed. So the engine that that was built on, which has not changed, you know, has really reached its limitations. And that's why Esri had to go back and couldn't just upgrade ArcMap and Arc Catalog, and put a new interface on it. It's, they had to redo the whole thing. We're the whole different engine to really take advantage of, of capabilities we have now. So what we see with, with Arc Pro is it is Esri's newest desktop GIS application for the GIS professionals. Esri has a bunch of other desktop stuff out there now too, but this is for you, the GIS professional, the one that's out there authoring data, doing analysis, creating tools, and all those kind of things. It is replacing, let me say that again, it is replacing ArcMap, Arc Catalog, Arc Scene, and Arc Globe. Now, the next question is, well, when is that going to happen? And I wish I could tell you, because every time I talk to Esri, I get a different answer. I've heard everything from, you know, next week <laughs> to seven years from now. So, uh, any, any Esri employees in here? <laughs> I should have asked that to start with. Okay, good. Uh, so remember, what happens at NCGIS stays at NCGIS, right? <laughs> I am an Esri business partner, so be careful what you tell them. Uh, but yeah, I, I can't tell you exactly when they're going to drop the hammer. I mean, I, I, when we went through the transition from Arc Info and Arc View into ArcGIS Pro, or I'm sorry, into ArcGIS, you know, they kept dragging that out. Uh, so, you know, 
when you're going to be absolutely positively pushed to shift, I can't tell you. Uh, but I can tell you if you go to their website, Esri's website, you look under the products, you're not going to see any mention, at least initially, unless you do a deep dive about ArcMap and Arc Catalog. It's all Arc Pro. You go to buy new licenses, you're buying new licenses of Arc Pro, and then they'll, on the backside, give you an Arc Map and Arc Catalog license to go with that. So this is coming. And it is built on a whole new architecture. It is .NET, uh, as opposed to, I think it was COM architecture that Arc Map and, and whatnot was built on, which means it is 64-bit enabled. So most all of it's 64-bit. There's still some tools in there that are embedded in, in 32. But what this 64-bit does is really open up the capability to use our modern hardware that we have uh, available to us. So what... What is one of the big benefits that 64-bit brings to the table that removes a limitation we had in the 32-bit environment of ArcMap and Arc Catalog? Uh, that's a question to y'all. I, I believe in being interactive with the audience. So, more RAM. Yeah, absolutely. What was the what's the limit on a 32-bit application as far as RAM? Four gigabytes. So you could have a system that has 64 gigs of RAM. If you're running ArcMap and Arcade, it's only going to see four, right? So you're not going to be able to leverage from the ArcGIS perspective all that additional RAM. It's only going to see the four. Doesn't mean you don't get bonuses because Windows is using other, you know, and all that stuff. But from an ArcGIS perspective, you can only see that. With ArcGIS Pro, it can theoretically use as much RAM as you want to throw at it. So if you have 64 gigs of RAM, it needs 60, it'll use it. Which means it typically does run faster. And I can tell you from my own personal experiences that I'm seeing things that used to take an hour or something to run, some sort of analysis to run in ArcMap, if it ran at all, that it would, you know, it, it does it in 15 minutes. Again, depending on your hardware. I run some pretty beefy hardware. But... Uh, I also don't have to divide data sets up. There was, there was a lot of times when I would try to say geocode a table of addresses, and it would be say 300,000 addresses, I, you know, I had to cut that up into parts in order to get it run into ArcMap. I don't have to do that in Pro anymore because it's able to use this. It also supports something called hyper-threading. How many of y'all know what hyper-threading is? Something else. <laughs> That's a good, good guess. Um, no, but when you when you go to buy a new computer nowadays, yeah, aside from how much hard disk space do I have and how much RAM do I have, and is it an Intel or AMD? Is it an i you know i three, i five, i seven? What what do you look at from a processor's perspective? What's another value associated with the processor that you look at? Cores. The number of cores. You've heard dual core, quad core processors, right? Well, what hyper-threading is, and I'm boiling this down very simplistically because there's a lot more behind it, and if you're an IT person and really get into this, pardon me being so simplistic about this, but it's the ability of software to look at all of those cores and go, okay, core one, you handle this part of the processing, core two, you handle this part of the processing, core three, and core four, and, and so on. It's the ability to divvy up across those multiple cores. Uh, in, in basic layman terms. ArcMap is not set up to do that out of the box. Now, if you download the 64-bit geoprocessing patch and install it, some of the tools will do that, but not out of the, the box. Art Pro right out of the box is going to be able to leverage all of those cores. And I can tell you it does it. I've just built a Ryzen 7 2700X 8-core 16-thread system for myself. That's nice when you're the boss of the company, you can do these things. And when I start running some pretty heavy geoprocessing, it's using every dang one of those, running through all those threads out there, which means you get, again, increased performance. We also are able to leverage GPUs. What's GPU stand for? Graphics, graphics processor unit. Absolutely. Uh, it's able to then parse out this graphics load, and you know, it's all visualization, right? So pretty heavy graphics load out to a standalone GPU instead of having to, to rely on the uh, CPU for all that. The other nice thing that Arc Pro brings to the, the table is the ability to do both 2D and 3D mapping 
right out of the box. You do not have to have the 3D Analyst extension in order to do 3D. This really opens up a whole new way, and I'll show you all this uh, when I get into kind of some demo stuff, a whole new way to visualize your data. It's not just going to be limited to infrastructure, right? That's what we normally associate 3D with, with utilities and bridges, roads, all that kind of stuff. But it look, gives us a whole new way to, to really visualize that information that can really show you patterns you may not have seen, also show you impacts that are, are out there. So that's a, a great tool to, to have. And, and don't think your data has to be natively 3D for this to work. Any data set can be visualized in 3D. One of the, the things I like about Pro is it goes back to projects. So for those of us that do remember ArcView and we had those APR files, they're back. They're APRX files, but the same concept is there. In a single project, we can have multiple maps, or what we call data frames in ArcMap. We can have multiple layouts, as many as you want, multiple data connections, multiple folder connections, and, and so on in that one project. So what this means is when you have, you know, and I know it's not that unusual to have hundreds of MXDs, right? Uh, I've seen some clients that have upwards of 500 MXDs that they're trying to manage and figure out. Well, I can combine most of those into a lot fewer projects. Now, you may not want to shove 500 MXDs worth of stuff into a single project because the more stuff you shove in, the more resources and all that kind of stuff. But it's going to reduce the amount of files that we have to manage. And remember, which was the right one I have to open? You just have your project in there. So, uh, again... In my mind, a lot of things, I equate Arc Pro to what Arc View would have been by now if they had kept developing it and expanding its capabilities. And you'll see, for those that are that old, you'll see a lot of similarities, I think, if you can think back that far. Um, mine's starting to slip out, but we'll see that going on. And of course, we have a new interface, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But one of the first things I want to dissuade everybody is just because your computer right now runs ArcMap and whatnot without any problem, do not think that this means that you'll be able to run ArcGIS Pro. The hardware requirements to successfully run Arc Pro are much higher. So there is a chance you'll either need to upgrade the components in your existing desktop or buy whole new computers in order to, to do this. And again, this is part of uh, Arc Pro's ability to leverage some of these new tools and do more things going forward. So what do you need? What are the, the hardware requirements? Well, this is what Esri recommends, a hyper-threaded dual core with four gigs of RAM, uh, capable of 1024 by 768 with DirectX, anyway, y'all can read this, and 32 gigabytes of free space. This is the minimum recommendation. I will tell you, if that's the minimum, if that's what your computer is minimum, it will run, meaning you'll install it and you can open it. <laughs> you might be able to open a simple 2D map, but your experience is not going to be one that's very happy there. Esri recommends, really recommends at least a quad-core processor with 8 gig of RAM, a dedicated video card with a uh, GPU and 8 gigabytes of video memory on it that supports these DirectX shaders, and again, the 32 gigabytes of free space. And you think, hold it, why 32 gigabytes? That's a lot of free, why do I need 32, especially if I'm working on data that's on a server or an SDE or whatever, why do I need? Well, that's because Arc Pro, one of the things it does to improve performance is it tries to cache everything. So every map you open, every scene you look at, everything you do, like it tries to build a local cache of that, and so it needs space to do that in. So they, they've just stuck that 32 gigabytes of free space on there. That's not what the install takes. The install doesn't take anywhere close to 32 gigs. Uh, but just to have that free space for all the caching that it likes to do in the background. Now, what is my recommendation? As somebody that's been running this stuff for a while, well, if you have a basic user, this is somebody that just opens a map, runs simple queries, prints, maybe does even some simple editing. They're not doing heavy analysis or, or, or working with large data sets or anything. So at a minimum, I would recommend this type user have an Intel i5 or one of the new Ryzen 3s. I've been testing Arc Pro and Arc Map on the new Ryzen CPUs. 
because the older Athlon uh, and AMD processors did not play well with ArcGIS. The Ryzen ones seem to do phenomenal. And they're a lot cheaper than the equivalent Intel right now. So uh, again, the, the Intel i5 or Ryzen 3, I would not touch an Intel i3 processor for running any sort of desktop GIS application. Personally, eight gig of RAM, definitely have a GPU. You know, a dedicated GPU. Do not use integrated graphics, especially Intel integrated graphics. The um, AMD integrated uh, Vega graphics are actually pretty good for a basic user. You might be able to get by without uh, with that, uh, especially if they're not doing any 3D, but just be uh, aware. Uh, one terabyte SATA drive, 7200 RPM. That's the speed at which those platters are spinning. They have much faster seek times. Uh, you don't have delays in read writes, so I, don't, I would not use the 5400 RPM on there. And then a good gigabyte net network adapter, unless you've gone to the 10 gig networks, then go up to that, but not many people are running those yet. And then a good monitor. You know, this I see people running on these little teeny dinky 20 monitor, inch monitors or 22 inch monitors. Uh, the production increase you get out of 27 is well worth the price, and they're not that expensive. You do not have to get a, a full on gaming 4K monitor. You can get, you know, get one that does 1080p, and it's perfectly fine for what we do in GIS. They're 129 bucks or something like that, uh, so not very expensive to get into that. But what I'd really recommend is this setup. So again, the Intel uh, i5 or Ryzen 3 quad-core or better processor, at least 12 gigabytes of RAM, uh, definitely having the GPU with 4 gigabytes of video RAM, and def uh, certainly if they're working in 3D, uh, you've got to have that dedicated video card in there. A 512 gigabyte SSD, solid state drive. Much faster seek times, much better. You'll notice the boot on an SSD drive is so much faster. Uh, in Arc, even ArcMap will start, you know, we know ArcMap like takes five minutes to start. You, go, you start in the morning and go get coffee. And they, well, even on an SSD, it's going to start in half the time. So getting that. And then dual monitors, the 1080p or better. Uh, so you've still got room because even in Arc Pro you can have different panes open and things on those other monitors. So you want to be able to do that. For your power users, what I recommend is the uh, you know, minimum of an uh, i7 uh, quad-core processor or a Ryzen 5 quad-core processor. 16 gig of RAM I found is pretty much the sweet spot. Uh, I, my laptop that I'm running up there has 32 gig of RAM and I never really seem to come close to that. Uh, the 16 gig seems to be just there, just enough to do things. Now, I'm not working with huge data sets, so if you have a huge data set, it might be different, but 16 seems to be very, very sufficient and get you the performance you need. Uh, definitely that dedicated uh, GPU. Um, I prefer NVIDIA, that's just m me personally, what I like out there, but if you want to go with one of the AMD video cards, that, that's fine. Again, the, the 7200 RPM mechanical drive and the dual 27s. Uh, really recommend for hardcore users, get a, a higher level GPU, at least six gigabytes of video RAM on, on there with 16 gigs uh, of memory, and then uh, the SSDs. Now, in my system I just built, I've got, uh, a, so I'm not trying to get too technical, but I have a, <laughs> An NVMe, which is a new type of uh, SSD, it looks more like a RAM stick that has amazingly fast uh, access times on it. So that's my boot drive and all my programs go in there. Then I have a traditional SSD uh, SATA 3 drive where all of my GIS data goes. And then I have a mechanical drive in there for archival purposes and for things that are a lot smaller like documents and pictures and stuff like that uh, in there. Uh, so I'm running three drives, but that's, that's me. Uh, triple monitors or get one big one. I've got a nice 43 inch curved Samsung monitor that I just got and a 27 inch monitor sitting next to it. So I've got three monitors worth of screen space. Uh, but again, that's me. I also do gaming and video editing and some other things. But again, you get one of those 1080p 27s, they're not that expensive out there. But it just gives you enough to have two monitors for GIS and one monitor for source documents or your email or whatever on there, uh, the product, productivity increase pays for, for all of that. 
So the things I don't recommend, as I mentioned, the i3 or lesser processors, older AMD processors. So the Athlons and whatnot going back, the Ryzen's great, recommend those. Uh, the slower mechanical hard drives, the 5400 RPMs, they're just rewrite speeds or, or not where they need to be for good effective data transfers in there. And then again, those edit, integrated graphics where you're leveraging the CPU and your system RAM to handle the graphics load. It, it just, especially if your system's on that low end, you're, you're on the closer to the minimum requirements, then yeah, I've seen systems, it'll just crash. I mean, it just won't work. Uh, as I mentioned, the AMD Vega graphics will help you out. Now, if you go to this, this link and it's on the, the, the pro website from Esri, they actually have a, a system, a tool you can run to test your system to see if it's capable. It'll give you a report showing you where you're lacking or where you're, you're not out there uh, just to check things out. And it not only checks hardware, but it checks software because there's certain software requirements you have to have. Because it's 64-bit, you must have a 64-bit OS. And it must be Windows. Okay? So whether it's 7, 8, 1, or 10, or server, uh, 2008, 12, 2016, uh, as long as 64-bit, you can run it. It doesn't matter if it's home or professional edition or any of those kind of things. This has to be a 64-bit OS. It is not supported on Linux or iOS. Even though you see all these Esri people running around with Apple laptops, they're booting into Windows uh, to run it. Esri, from what I have seen and heard, has no plans to, to port uh, Pro into the I, Apple environment uh, because 90% of their user base is y'all governments. And from what I understand, that trying to get an Apple device approved through the procurement process is not the easiest thing in the world, not compared to Windows. So there, there's no plans to port it into the Apple world from this desk, from, for Arc Pro. Obviously, they have Apple apps and all that stuff. Uh, there's no plan for Linux yet. However, uh, my own personal belief is that once they kind of get it more stabilized because their server, enterprise, whatever they're calling it today, will run in a Linux environment that maybe Pro will get ported there at some point uh, just because. But I, I, again, that's my own personal preference. You do, do need to make sure you have the 4.6.1.net uh, framework installed. And here's a silly one. You must have Internet Explorer 11 or above installed, and it doesn't mean you have to use it, but it has to be installed. That's, when you, when you go through Arc Pro, which is heavily integrated with Arc Online, so when you log into Pro for your license, if you're using Arc Online to manage your licenses, it leverages the IE engine to do that connection. When you go to add the Esri base maps into a map or scene, it leverages that art, the Internet Explorer engine to make that connection on there. And you would think that, well, if that's such a critical part, when you run the install, it would actually check and tell, no, you're not, you're running IE9 or, you know, I, I don't use IE, so I don't ever pay attention to what the current version is because I don't touch it. I'm using Firefox or I'm using Chrome. But, yeah, you've got to be running that, and it won't tell you. And you'll just notice, if you have like IE9 or 10, it'll install, and you'll probably even be able to open Arc Pro and maybe even log in, but weird flaky stuff is going to start happening, especially if you start leveraging any of the online services through ArcGIS Online or even through your own portal ArcGIS server. Uh, so, yeah, you got to have that, which also means you need to check because... You may have other systems installed, billing systems, permitting systems that may be web-based, but they're built on older versions of IE. And so you may not be able to upgrade. Uh, you need to check all that out before you do that. Also, with the 64-bit OS, that also means you have to use the 64-bit database client to connect to things like SQL Server, Oracle, or whatnot. Um, again, so if you have other systems that are requiring the 32-bit client or you're trying to run ArcMap and Arc Pro simultaneously, you've got to have two, those two separate database clients on there, which can present some challenges as well. Yes? Yeah, they couldn't get the system to work, so sorry. Yeah, that's, they were fighting with it up here. Sorry. 
Um, but I'll, I'll be happy if somebody wants to email me or whatnot. Uh, I'll be happy to share these with, with anybody that wants them. No problem. So, and I'll make sure I'll put some cards up here later. Uh, the other thing here is that um, you must have, well, we'll talk about this a little bit. There's, there's different ways to license Arc Pro, but by default, it's all your licenses are assigned to named users through ArcGIS Online. That's the default, which means you must also have a connection to ArcGIS Online. Um, but you can also run it through Portal and do it that way, so you got to connect to that. Uh, anyway, that ties back into the Internet Explorer. Uh, but Arc Desktop is not required, so you don't have to have Arc Map and Arc Catalog installed. Although right now, if you're paying your annual maintenance, you get one. For every license of Arc Map you have, you get one license of Arc Pro equivalent. But they're not linked. So you could have Arc Map running on this person's computer and then take the Arc Pro license and assign it to another named user. It doesn't have to be the same. So you can, you're basically getting two for the price of one right now. Okay? Keep that much. Now, as I mentioned, it uses a whole new ribbon interface. This is very similar to what you see in Word, Excel, PowerPoint, AutoCAD. My experience has shown that new users find this much easier to learn. I get people that have never touched ArcMap, Arc Catalog. You sit them down, you start working with this, and they're going to town, right? Whereas ArcMap, Arc Catalog, you know, toolbars. What are these toolbar things you're talking about? I've never seen them before. You know, it's an old, older interface. It takes them a lot longer. So this new ribbon interface uh, really is more intuitive for those new users. For us existing users, it's not too bad. Don't don't get scared off. Again, if you're using Word and Excel and all that with the same kind of, then this transition shouldn't be too hard. It's actually fairly nice in that I can select, say, a layer over here in my content, and then I'm going to get new tabs in the ribbon that deal with layer controls for symbology, labeling, database access in there. If I go into a layout, then I get specific things dealing with layout. So there's no more trying to find, where'd the layout toolbar go? Where's the tools toolbar? Where's the the geo, uh, uh, the topology toolbar, all of those kind of things. They, they just automatically pop up. Now there's some terminology changes which I think are absolute silly. We now call these panes instead of windows. So you, we have the table of contents window over here and the catalog window. This is now the contents pane and the project pane. Or the, it's now called the catalog pane. I need to update that. But So Art Pro is full of panes. I like that, yep. But they do the same thing. Same function, I can pull them out, I can dock them, I can pin them in place, I can have them auto-hide. All the same things that you do in the Windows and Arc Pro, it's the, the same uh, with that. So it's just a very different interface from what we're looking at, and I'll talk more and show you some of that. Some key functionality, so from an editing, maintaining standpoint, if you're an SDE or file geodatabases, go to town. You can still keep editing those, uh, maintaining those, the actual editing workflow in Arc Pro is very similar to Arc Map. You still have your feature templates, you still have the construct tools. Uh, they've kind of moved where they're at, but it's it's very similar. Uh, anybody running personal geodatabases? Those MDB files? A couple of y'all? Um, yeah, those have to go away. Uh, Pro does not support, nor will it ever support, Personal geodatabases, you can't even read it. When, you know, there, it's not even, not, it's not that it won't edit it, you can't even read it. So you need to port those over into a file geodatabase or SD Enterprise, whatever, uh, with that. Shape files, still there, you can still use them. If you, if we all love our shape files, so you can keep those in there. Um, and of course, topologies are supported in. Uh, Arc Pro, both map and geodatabase topology. So if you have those already built, they'll still be there. Uh, one of the nice things with Pro talking about editing is that in Arc Map, how many workspaces can you edit in at what time? One, right? So you can edit one geodatabase at a time or one group of shape files in a certain folder at a time. So if you have a map that has a mix, Right, you'd have to start editing, edit one, save that, stop editing, start editing again. Edit. Arc Pro, if it's an editable file and it's in your map, it doesn't care where it's stored at. So you can edit shape files and geodatabase feature classes all at one time. And you can even apply the map topology tools to that. 
So if you're trying to edit something and keep it coincident or adjacent or whatever that relationship is, with the MAT topology edit tools, I can do edits to shapefiles and geodatabases to maintain the topological integrity of the data. So that's kind of a real nice thing. Uh, multiple layouts are back, we love that. So again, no need to have multiple MXDs. You can, and there's no limit. You can have as many, or as many layouts in there as you want. And you can insert as many maps into a single layout as you want. So maps being like feature data sets in there. So you got more tools and buttons for geoprocessing. And one of the nice things about a lot of the, the, the functions in Arc Pro that we don't have in Arc Map is they're tied directly into the geoprocessing framework. What's the advantage of having those tools like the select by attributes or do a spatial select or, or whatnot? What's the advantage of having them tied into the geoprocessing framework? What can you do with any tool that's in Arc Toolbox? What can you include it in? Into a model, into a Python script, right? So I can't tell you how many times I've figured out a, a workflow in ArcMap and then try to build a model to replicate it and suddenly you find, oh, that's just a tool. It's not a geoprocessing tool. So now I need to figure out what geoprocessing tool or series of geoprocessing tools mimics that button that's in the ArcMap toolbar to do that. So now most all of these tools are part of the geoprocessing framework. So once you figure it out, you just go find the tool and boom, 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 you build your model. There's no trying to re-engineer that workflow once you've got it worked out. So that really increases the flexibility of some of these models and things that we do. Uh, one thing that does kind of drive me nuts with Pro and their development team is that it is all optimized for web publishing. It's heavily integrated with Portal and ArcGIS Online, which means they're leaving certain things out that don't. So for one example, and I'll mention this again later, I'm sure, is map anno and map graphics. So we use the draw toolbar in Arc Map to go project here or look here or whatever it is. You just jump a dump a quick graphic in the map, not in the layout, I'm talking about in the map itself. You can't do that in Pro. They want you to use these map notes, which create a new shape file, <laughs> which is something else you got to deal with. And Esri's reasoning for this, at least in my conversations with some of the, is, well, those map anno, that doesn't translate well into a web service. And it's like, well, I don't care. I'm not doing it for a web service. I'm generating a printed map or a PDF. I'm not pushing this to the web. Well, why aren't you? You should push it to the web. <laughs> uh, because that's not what my client's paying me for? Well, they should. Well, not everybody needs a web app in the, the field. Sometimes they just want to give something to somebody to look at or whatever. Well, they really ought to use what? It's like, do you work with your own stuff? I mean, come on. Do you? Um, so things like that. And they're saying they're not going to, to include that at any point. Uh, maybe we'll change their minds and whatnot. Uh, so there is good and bad with the, the web publishing optimization. That's one bad point. Uh, the one good point is that what you, what you see in Arc Pro when you push it to Arc Online or Portal is pretty much what you're going to get over there. It doesn't, there's not a lot of change in there. Uh, especially if you use things like the new Arcade expression language to control symbology and labeling and stuff like that. Then that really carries across well. The other nice thing with Pro is something called tasks. So this used to require, work, was it Workflow Manager? I think in, in Arc Map where you can set up these, these specific workflows, right? This is how you edit a parcel. Select the parcel, zoom to the parcel, you know, reference your, your source documents, open the, Co the Kogo tool, you know, whatever it is. Uh, you, in Pro, you can build these step-by-step -step tasks and they can be just text that tell people what to do or they can even have automation in them where they select specific tools or even run specific scripts or models in there and that's part of the core product. So you can really standardize workflows. Because I can't tell you how many times I've been somewhere um, when there's one person that knows how to do this one thing. And if that one person goes on vacation, that thing can't be done. <laughs> right? So, but I can create a task so that if they go on vacation, somebody else can go through that task and they might not be as fast as the normal person or whatever, but they can get it done. Right? And it also provides you with a training tool. How do you train somebody else to do things? So that's pretty cool that that's in there. Right? 
Some other things we can't do right now. So edit and maintain geometric networks. How many of y'all using geometric networks? Ah, good number of y'all. Well, have y'all looked at the new utility data model extension thing that Esri is coming out? I would suggest you do so because geometric networks going away, being replaced by that new utility network model that's coming out. Um, so that's, like I said, you can view geometric networks, print, query, everything for, in Arc Pro. You cannot edit any data that's part of a ge geometric network. Again, Esri's going to something different. Uh, the parcel fabric. How many of y'all using parcel fabric? Good number of y'all. Um, it's not currently supported in Pro. And if you haven't heard yet, and please feel free to let Esri know what you think about this, they're coming out with a new parcel fabric that requires enterprise and portal to do, which means all of your, your stuff is gonna to have to be ported over into the new one, and that's what's gonna be supported in Pro going forward. Yeah, I just found that out a few weeks ago. Um, again, it's supposed to be web optimized. That's why they can't use the old one because it's not web anyway. Uh, mention personal geodatabases, they're not supported. Cartographic representations, if you're using those, they're not supported. Uh, and I don't know that those will be because of the new arcade expression language that Esri's got out there. Mention map annotation graphics. Uh, here's one that drives me nuts because when Pro first came out, it could do this. But if you build models like me and then export them to scripts because I'm not a programmer, you can't do that. No exporting a model to a script and they don't want to put that in. Apparently, uh, this is what I was told, is the tech support team gets tired of getting calls from people that build a model, export it to a script, and then expect it to just run because they don't understand what the script does and you have to do some tweaking on it after you export it, that they don't want to have to deal with those calls anymore, so that we're just not going to make that a function any longer. Um, there is a place called ideas.arcgis.com. So any of these things that it doesn't do, you don't like, you can go there, find out if people have posted things. Like I have something on the annotation graphics, I have something on the six port models uh, to scripts out there. You can give it a vote up and also leave a comment as to why you need that. What is a workflow? What's a work case uh, for that? And hopefully the more we put that in there, it'll work. Uh, Python add-ins, so not Python scripts. Python scripts still work in Arc Pro. And many of the ones you've written in ArcMap, if they're simple enough, will carry forward. What add-ins are, are where you've made custom toolbars and you, uh, GUI interfaces to run those, those will not work in Arc Pro. Uh, you have to kind of redo those in a .NET envelope, because that's what it's built on .NET. I don't know if they'll ever add that capability in. I don't know what the, if it's a limitation of Pro or if it's a limitation of Python. I don't know why that's not there yet, so I, I can't tell you if they're going to add that or not uh, in there. Okay, so what I'm going to do, any questions so far? Yes? No, no model scheduling. No, you can't schedule a model. Model has to be run inside of the software. So, yep, no, no. Yeah, so they want you to learn Python, I guess. or pay a consultant to, to do something, whatever. It's, okay, other question, I saw some more hands. Uh, back there and then we'll get to, to you, yes. I'll demo, I'll show you that, when we get in the demo, we actually get into some of the settings and all that, but yes, I'll get that, yes. Mm -hmm. Some of it's models, some of it's Python scripts, I'm trying to make it all Python scripts. Will our toolbox, how, is, how does that transfer into our Um One, if you connect to the source, whether it's a TBX file or in your geo database, you can connect to it, you'll have access to it. Okay? Uh, I found most all of my models run. I, I've not had one yet that didn't run that I had created for ArcMap. Doesn't mean you won't encounter that, but might have been good. Uh, your scripts, your actual Python scripts, there is a, a setting, and I'll show you that you can have it test before it runs. Uh, but you, there may have to be some tweak, because it does use a different version of Python. 
right? So there may have to be some tweaking of those scripts on there. Good question. Yes, over here. Um, I, I do it and have no problems. The, the only problem I've heard people have is if they are connecting to SDE or a SQL database or something where you've got to have the 32-bit client for ArcMap or you've got a 64-bit client for Arc Pro. And I, I've seen people tackle it a couple of different ways. Uh, Bay County, Florida actually has a little batch file or script that they have to run between going between, that actually swaps out the client on the back end. I've seen people run dual boots. I've seen a couple of different things. But if you're just connecting to file geodatabases or web services or anything like that, yeah, you're on the same machine, no problems. No, no problem whatsoever. Yes, sir. No, geodatabase annotation, fully supported. Layout annotation and graphics, fully supported. It's only that which you draw directly in the, the map view that's it, not supported. So yeah, geodatabase works fine. Feature linked, non-feature linked, and they just added at, um, is it uh, we up to 2.3? Three now, yeah. Two dot, matter of fact, it's two dot three dot one because just the other night a patch dropped for Arc Pro, um, but it uh, supports dimensions too. So if you go, have the old dimension type uh, in there, it's supported now. Pro, yes, sir. Uh, as far as I know, that's the only choice right now. I don't know if they have other plans going forward. Yeah. <laughs> So, so that that's yeah. <laughs> I can't uh, any more before we kind of jump in and, and start looking at the software. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. So. There's a lot of variability. Uh, so I just bought a laptop for one of my analysts, and it was just right around 1100 bucks for a Dell 15-inch gaming. And I buy gaming systems, because I find they have the graphics capability and all that, and they're a fraction of the price of the workstations uh, that are similar in spec to that. Uh, the the uh, desktop I just built for myself is I kept adding to it and adding to it and wanted to try fancy things like water cooling and stuff. <laughs> I, I probably ended up spending you know about 2,500 bucks on, on my uh, system. Uh, one of the, so one of the nice things we have from a hardware perspective, last year at this time, prices for graphics card and RAM were through the roof. And that was because of, well, largely Bitcoin mining. So if anybody's heard of Bitcoin, a bunch of folks were buying up RAM and video cards and jumping them into low-end computers and just connecting to the internet, hooking to Bitcoin, and then basically they were almost like a, one of the vaults used to store and process Bitcoin. And they got a cut of each transaction and whatnot that happened on that. And so what that meant is that there was no video cards out there. <laughs> and so those that were... The, the cost of them was like twice the MSRP. So what would normally be a $300 video card was now, you know, six, $900 cards. Well, Bitcoin has collapsed. And so that's gone. Uh, NVIDIA has come out with a whole new series of video cards, the, the 2000 series. Uh, AMD is coming out with a new series of cards. Um, so all of those prices have now dropped. Uh, I got a good the video card in my system. I didn't go top of the line on the video card. I got a mid grade. It's a Nvidia RTX 2060. I paid 350 bucks for it. That was MSRP. It wasn't insulated, and it's a very good. It's got six gigs of, of, of video RAM on it. it it's, as I said, it 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 does really well on all my benchmarks. Um, so prices are coming down, and same with RAM. RAM prices are coming down. I got 16 gigs of RAM. High end, 30, uh, 3200 speed RAM for 100, 115 bucks. So that's the good news. The cost of the systems you'll need to buy to run this stuff are on the way down. So yeah, you, I mean, you're, you're probably looking at around 
uh, the $1,200 range for a, a good base system that's, that's enough. If you're high-end editing and all that stuff, or high, then you might need to go up to $2,500, but not, not, not the $5,000 it would have been a, couple, uh, you know, a few months ago. Right, so we, we've got some of the things like that. So. Good question. Uh, yes? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I, well, what I would do, if I, if I run the model in ArcMap and I run it in Arc Pro and it works, I'll go back to ArcMap and use ArcMap to export to Python. But that, that's, like I said, I'm not a, I'm not a programmer. I, I know enough Python to be very dangerous and enough to like teach an intro to Python class. Uh, but I, my other alternative is I go to my developer and say, hey, developer, fix this for me. So, uh, yeah, sorry, I, <laughs> I wish you had a better... There's a question over here, somewhere, I see. Well, let's get into the demo side of this, and if you have some questions as we're going through, this, that'll be fine. Um, somebody make sure to get my attention as I'm staring down at my, my screen. So, I've already launched Arc Pro. Arc, Arc Pro launches a whole lot faster than ArcMap ever thought about doing. I should say the laptop I'm running this on, this Asus, um, I think it's a GT70. It's now probably four years old. It is an, an old, uh, I think it's a seventh generation Intel i7 quad core processor. It does have 32 gigs of RAM and it is running a GeForce 970M graphics card. So it does have a dedicated graphics card on it as well as apparently jets on the back end of it. Um, but this is now the opening screen. One of the nice things with the, the current version of Pro is that you can open it and start working without having to open a project. Okay, previous versions you always had to open a project. So now if you just need to jump in, do something real quick with uh, the, the 2.3, and later you've got this option to uh, start without a template or start without opening a project if you want to. Of course, you can still create your project files uh, here, and then any of your recent projects are gonna be here. This is where you're going to log in. So by default, your licenses are managed through ArcGIS Online by your administrator, whoever that happens to be. So go in here just so you can see where that's done. Sign into my organizational account. Yeah, 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 I've got, you've updated how you do that. You don't have to tell me every time. Okay, so now, when you log into Arc Online, depending on your user rights, you may see something completely different. I'm the admin for my organization, so this is what I see. I'm starting in the overview of my organization, so I can see the number of credits I have, the uh, number used in the last 30 days, and so on. So a bunch of just kind of uh, uh, base information with my account. Uh, see the number of users I have to assign and whatnot. So first thing you've got to do if you're using the default licensing method is if you want to assign a license to a user, they have to be a member of your ArcGIS Online organization. So they have to have a user login. So you'll have to go in here to invite the member to create them if they're not already there. If they are already there, then you're going to be able to go over here to licenses. And this is where you can go in and assign. So you can see I have uh, basic and advanced licenses here. I've got 20 total advanced, five basic, and then these are all the extensions. So yes, Arc Pro has all of those extensions that we have in Arc Map. So if I want to assign, say, my uh, advanced license to somebody, I click there, then this is all the people that are in my organization. And uh, I'll give my wife a license. So this is my wife, she does accounting stuff for me. So I'm gonna give her a license because she, she definitely needs that for accounting, right? She gotta know where she's sending the bill to, whatever. Um, yeah, I talk about GIS and all she says is she hears blah, 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 blah. So I've just assigned that license to her. So now her user login, she can go to her computer and do that. What that means is with my login, I can go to any computer that has an internet connection and in, assuming I have rights, install Arc Pro and run it. Right, so I could, and I, I have, this is installed on my laptop, my desktop, and I even have a Surface Pro back here that I've used in a pinch. So it's installed on three computers, but I can go to either one of them and do it. 
Okay? And then I can go back once I've assigned it to there. And if I want to assign extensions, I can do it from here. You can also go through the user interface and, and assign these all at once as well. Now, the one drawback I have to this from, say, the license manager is that it takes the admin to assign it. So if you only have, you know, two 3D analyst licenses, but you have potentially five people that can, may need it at some point in time, you as the admin, they have to keep coming, can you give me the license and take it away from so-and-so? Yeah. Not using this licensing model. You can, Arc Pro does still support single use licensing and concurrent use or network licensing. However, you've got to get, the admin has to go through the My ESRI portal and convert licenses from named user to concurrent or single use licenses and do all that. This is the default licensing model. So, yeah. <laughs> They do have a standard. I, I just don't have standard licenses. These are just the ones that, as, as a business partner, I get so many basic, and because I am a, a training, per, you know, we have a special contract for training software with Esri, I get so many advanced licenses as a part of that deal. Yes? Yep. You're only supposed to run it on one machine at a time. Well, you're only supposed to do it that way. It doesn't mean that I, I can neither confirm nor deny that I may have had five machines up and running. <laughs> um, so, so yeah. <laughs> also, somebody asked about the was asking about the check-in, check-out. So this is where you can set it to allow or disallow users to take it offline meaning they don't have to be connected to the web to use the software. So the, you know, the drawback to this is it's all or nothing. It's either all users can do it or no users can do it. So you can't group it or control it, at least not yet. I'm, I'm hoping that changes uh, because we'll talk about something in a minute that is a gotcha you need to be aware of. Okay, so like I said, this is how you manage the licenses through ArcGIS Online. Portal, if you do it through Portal, it's gonna look very similar. Uh, and then like I said you can do the others if you take the time to convert that. So back into here. Whoops, I was already there. So I'm gonna go ahead and open a project I have here. There we go, open up the project. And take it full screen so you can see that. Okay. So here you can see the, the new interface that is available. So one of the things that is different is this new Explore tool. So this is what I refer to as kind of the jack of all trades because it's your pan tool, your zoom tool, and your identify tool all in one. Okay, so you can get in here with it, click, you want to pan, you're just holding it down. You want to zoom out, you use your wheel mouse to zoom out. You want to zoom in uh, on a window, you hit your shift key, and that allows you to zoom in on a window. See? If I want to identify something, I click on it, and it opens up the pop-up window. So this is also something that's different, and that cable is very funky. Uh, all, all of your pop-ups for your identify are now HTML pop-up windows, which is good and bad. Okay? So the, the good part is that this is also what you'll see when you publish to ArcGIS Online, which means you can still go in and configure it. Uh, the other good thing about this is that in ArcMap, how many official uh, links, hot links, that was the term, could you have associated with one layer? One. Yeah, you go under display properties, configure the one hot link, whether it was to URL, to a document, or to a macro. Because this is HTML, if you put a path in there, whether it's a web path or a UNC path or a network, path, whatever, it becomes a hot link. So there's no configuring individual hot links now. It's just you store a path in there and it goes. 
right? So that's a, a nice thing. You don't have to try to configure the, there is a way in the geodatabase if you're using that to configure multi-linking and all that junk. Here it's just, you give it a path, okay? Now, one other thing on point, when anytime you're trying to specify a path in Arc Pro, whether it's a folder path, a database connection path, or whatever, it wants you to use a UNC path. Now, how many of y'all know what a UNC path is? Okay, uh, a good number of y'all do, but most of y'all don't. And that's not surprising to me. You're not IT people. So a UNC path is what IT folks use to connect to network or internet resources. It's gonna be slash slash server name, slash share name, slash folder name, slash file name, or whatever, depending on how far down you want to go. Okay? So, Esri doesn't like it when you use mapped drives. You can, but if you try to, say, create a project template that has folder or database connections, say, file geodatabases, that use a mapped drive, so if your network drive for all your geo is the M drive, right? And that's what you connect to. You connect to folders on the M drive, you connect to a file geo database on the M drive. If you create a project template that you're gonna use to create all your other projects based on, it's going to take that map drive and any database or shape files you have connected that are part of that and duplicate the data in the new project folder. It does this without telling you it does this. So if you're not paying attention, and when I was writing my book and building the exercises out, I was wondering why my exercise folder was getting so big when I kept using the same database, or I thought I was. Right? No, it, if you, but if you do it with a UNC path, it doesn't do that duplication. And again, I've, I've busted Esri, and they're like, well, just use UNC paths. I said, great, okay, I can. I know what it is, I was an IT guy before I was a GIS guy. I got it. But have you talked to your user base? As we just saw here, most of y'all had no idea what I was talking about. You never heard of the darn thing. And y'all are the norm. So don't feel bad if you didn't know about it. Y'all, that's normal. But according to Esri, why well, they, they should know this stuff. Why don't they know it? Because they don't, they don't have to. That's an IT function. Um, but you really do, you know, that's what Esri wants you to use. So be aware if you're using those map drives. Again, if you use the same project all the time, it's not a big deal. You create the project, create the connections, you're good. It's things with like templates, or even trying to publish some things to the web through your portal or ArcGIS Online, that those map drives might give you problems that you, you should use that UNC path. Okay, so we'll get back in here and look at this, this project, uh, some of the components in here. So here's the 2D map. We still have our good table of contents over here, although it's called the contents pane, but the same function, right? Still can drag things up and down in the draw order, just like you do in ArcMap. That hasn't changed. Uh, what has changed is the number of buttons that we have up here. So we had four in ArcMap. We have seven or something up here now. So draw order is still the same. That hasn't changed. List by source is still there. That hasn't changed. Uh, some things that have changed is the list by selection. So this is where you choose what layers are selectable. Then this is where you choose what layers are editable. This is a big difference in Arc Pro. You are always in an edit session. There's no starting and stopping editing. You can always edit data. The safety net is gone. I'll get to that in just a second. Okay, so you can always edit data, but this is where you control what layers you are able to edit. Now, permissions with SDE and all that stuff still apply, right? If you don't have editing permissions, you can't edit. But if, if it's editable and you have permission to edit, it's always editable. And remember what I said, it can edit shapefiles and geodatabases at the same time. Okay. So that's good and bad. Like I said, it means you don't have to worry about the stop, stopping, keep doing that back and forth, but it does open it up to accidentally doing something you're not supposed to. Now, in, in, in truth, 
To do most of the spatial editing, you actually need to click over here on the edit tab to get to the edit tools, right? To be able to reshape or to create a new or whatever. Um, but where it really is gonna get you is a table. If you have a table open and you've clicked in a cell, you can just fill in the value. And maybe you think you've clicked on your web browser or you're trying to type an email somewhere. You don't realize you're there, right? Uh, so do be aware of, of that. The, the other thing we've got is list by snapping. So in Art Pro, this is nice. Um, we can control what layers we snap to. So in Art Map, unless you're using classic snapping, if you're using the, the current Art Map snapping, every visible layer is snappable, and you can only control whether it's the, the edge, the vertice, uh, intersection, endpoint, you know, those kind of things. Well, here you actually control which layers you snap to by turning these on and off. You can control the edge, the endpoint, all that stuff up here under the snapping by going here or down here at the bottom, there's also a snapping tool. So in Arc Pro, there's always at least two ways to do everything. Sometimes there's three and four. So two places you control that, but this is where you control the layers. Yes, sir. Um, I believe so. Let me get into the options to verify that. I'm going to say, I know you can control visibility. I think editing too, but we'll check that in just a second. Good question. Um, this is labeling. This turns labeling on and off. So this is like your label manager. It's gone. It's now incorporated into uh, here in the contents pane for turning on and off, but you'll also see a labeling tab. So I have the buildings layer selected. Here's the labeling tab. So this is going to be where you configure your labels. What, you know, if you have multiple classes, label classes, this is where you're going to build the query to create those different classes. Then this is where you choose the field or the expression you're going to label by. And with Arc Pro, we're going to support um, several different labeling. And then here's the pane for building classes. So the expression, and here's the language. So we're going to support Arcade. How many of y'all have worked with Arcade yet? Okay, more than I expected. So. That's a new expression language that Esri's using that is, there we go, um, that is common across the board. It's supported in server, online, portal, as well as Arc Pro. So again, if you build a labeling expression using Arcade, what you see in Arc Pro is what you can see in Arc Online, what you can see in ArcGIS Server, or Arc Enterprise, whatever they're calling it today, right? Uh, but you can still, your Python expressions will come across if you use VB, because I still do a lot of VB, because that's what I taught, or was taught uh, there. So you still support those expressions for labeling. But this is where you're going to control that. Also, when you want to change, like, the symbology, what font, you're going to control that over here. Positions. So this is, by default, Arc Pro uses the Matplex label extension. So instead of defaulting to the old label, the standard label engine that Esri ArcMap does, this by default uses a Matplex, which is great. I, if I have to label, this is what I want to use. Now, I, I'm, I started out in AutoCAD, so I hate labels. I prefer annotation because I can be somewhat of a control freak. Uh, but uh, if I have to label, I'm going to use Matplex, and it, it is supported here. So that's a good thing included. And then lastly, if you have um, the imagery extension, then you can get list by imagery, anyway, perspective. I, I have just played with that, so I don't, I don't know what it does. But there is something I want to show you as a got you uh, in here. So remember, we've got list by selection and list by editing. So if I want to go in and edit, say, the buildings layer in here, and so I marked it as editing, editable, but say I'm going to turn it off and say it's not selectable. So I'm going to go in and say, um, this little building has been demolished, so let's zoom in. I'm going to go up here to my select, and I'm selecting on the building. I'm selecting on the... I want to select. I look over here. Well, it's editable. Why won't it let me select? Well, it's because it's not selectable. So don't sit there and fight with I sat there for 15 minutes one day trying to get something. I was like, why won't this, what's broken? It just, it wasn't set as selectable. Alternatively, if you're sitting on the selection and you've marked it as not editable, I go over here, I'm going to clear my selection real quick. And say, whoops, I don't want to edit parcels by mistake. So, okay. Got my building selected and I'm going to go to my edit tab and I want to reshape this building. Hold it, it deselected. 
Okay, well, here's the select tool up here. I'll just select it again. Again. Oh, Lord, God dang it, stupid program piece of what Jack Dangerman do. <laughs> right? That's because it's not editable. <laughs> so remember, those two work together when you're doing. By the way, anybody know what the official term is for selecting things in the map with your mouse? There's actually a term for that. It's called interactive selection. So if you pick things in the map, you now can say on your resume, I can perform interactive selections using ArtMap and ArcGIS Pro. <laughs> Sounds a whole lot more fancy than right picking it in the map. Um, anyway, so we get to, to kind of, again, see the, the, the contents. And like I said, it's un, you can undock it. The little docking, they still use these stupid docking icons, although instead of being blue arrows, they're now beige rectangles. Why you can't just drag it over here and go dock, I don't know, but you to drag your pointer there and, okay, I'm docked. Uh, still got the auto hide capability there. That hasn't changed or pin it in place. So again, you can push these off to another monitor. Yes? Not, not that I'm aware of. I haven't seen any anything. We'll verify that maybe with the new patch they've added something. But um, so we'll go over here to the project tab, kind of heading in that to look at some of our options. So uh, project tab, this is where you go to open an existing one, create a new one, save a project, save it as something else, connect to portals. Uh, here's the licensing. So assuming your licensing has been approved for working offline by your administrator, this is where you would go to authorize it to work offline. So you go in, you check that box, and now you can work offline. You don't have to be connected. Now here's the gotcha. Unlike Art Map and Art Catalog, when you check a license out, there's a time limit. Right? Through the license administrator, you set a time limit. If you're using Portal or ArcGIS Online domain, there is no time limit. It's checked out forever. Which means if you if I were to check it out to this laptop then I cannot go to my Surface and run it even if I don't have the software open here. Or I can't go to my desktop because it's locked to this device now. Which also means if I lose this device, the license is locked. And the only way to unlock it is to call Esri and get on their tech support and try to explain to them why you need the license unlocked. And they're not very happy about trying to do that because they may think you're, anyway, we don't like dealing with support. Okay, so uh, be very careful about using this capability. Not saying that there's not a time and place for it, because there absolutely is, but just keep that in mind. If that device is gone, damaged, destroyed, whatever, the only way to get that license back right now is to call Esri. So do that. So let's go into options now. So look at some of the options available. So they divide this into two parts. You got project and application options. So the current settings, this is where all your data is saved for your project. What's the name of the project? Where is the project file? So it's an APRX file, it's a project file. And just like MXDs don't store your data, neither does the APRX file. It just stores what maps are in there, how the layers are visualized, what layouts, all that kind of stuff just like MXDs do, then where is your, your home folder? So where is this APRX file generally set at there? Uh, what's, every project's gonna have a default database. So what's the default database for the project? And then what is the default toolbox? So if somebody was asking about that. Um, it's when I saved the, the project, I saved it using a map drive as opposed to a UNC drive. Um, but it doesn't, you still use map drives. It's just for certain things. Like I said, if you create a project template and then you use the template to create a new project, any of the, say you have a file geo database in there and you've got a, a map that has your, your base layer symbolized the way you want them for all new maps, right? When you create the new project using that template that references a map drive, it's going to create a copy of that original database and put it in your project folder. 
and you'll open, you'll see the map with the layers, and it looks all perfect, unless you go to check the source. Then you'll see it's not pointing to the right place. Uh, and again, if you're using SDE, this also is not a problem, because you're using a database string, you know, connection to that, so it, those come across well, but also be aware that uh, if you create a template using your user login, when somebody creates a new project using that, then they're going to have your your connection parts to that. So be be careful of that. Okay. Yes. Correct. Which could be good or bad, depending on what you're doing, right? Um, yes? Is there a way to get the ESC um, ring on the map for us? Usually, yes. Yeah, so, so if you go through Windows Explorer and you go to My PC, um, right up here where it'll have, I don't have any connected here, but you would see M drive and in parentheses, it usually have the UNC path on there. So you can see it, uh, at which point you can then also go to network, go find that, and it'll actually appear up here, and then you just copy and paste it. So, yep. Okay, so continuing down here, we've got units. So this is where you'll set your various units uh, in. So do remember there's a difference between U.S. survey feet and international feet. Uh, if anybody is from South Carolina, remember your state plane uses international feet. You're the only one in the southeast that does. And I know the story behind that if you ever want to ask about it. But anyway, so again, this is where you'll go through, set the various units in there. And then task, if you actually have a task, there is a, a, a workflow server you can connect to to where task, anyway, you can set that up here. Now application. So these are only things that apply to the current project you have open. Okay. These apply to any project that is currently open and ones you open or you create later. So when you start Arc Pro, do you want to have that start page or do you want to automatically open a specific project and, and whatnot? Again, same thing we do in Arc Map and then MXD. What happens when we create a new project, right? So by default, every new project you create, it's going to create a new folder. It's going to create a new project database. It's going to create a new project toolbox which is why you just don't go creating projects willy-nilly or you end up with a bunch of junk. Okay, uh, But you can control that here. You can specify certain things so it doesn't generate all this extra junk is the nice term. I have to stop. I used to be a sailor as well as a surveyor, so I can have some colorful language if I'm not careful. Your help source, so this is a thing if you are going to go out in the field, the default is to use Esri's online help. right? If you, say, are going to take a device in the field and may not have an internet connection, then you'll have to change this to use the installed help. That's also a completely separate install. So you have to download the help install and run it first, and then you can change this button. So keep that in mind. And then, lastly, this is just an appearance. You can change the, the theme, right? So right now I'm using the light theme. You can go to the dark theme, which where everything is white, it's now it would be black in the dark theme, and things that are, are like black text become white. So it looks for anybody that's used AutoCAD, it looks a lot like the AutoCAD interface. So if you're comfortable with that, um, you can change it here. It's good. Uh, map and scene behavior. So I'm not going to throw all these because they're a bunch, but you can control what happens with your base maps, what gets assigned, a default spatial reference, and so on. Navigation, this is one people like. Esri, for whatever reason, whether it's ArcMap or ArcScene or ArcGlobe or ArcPro, their mouse wheel is the exact opposite of everyone out there when it comes to zooming in, zooming out. This is where you can change it so it matches the rest of the world. Okay. So, uh, also, if you're running on something that is uh, touch screen enabled, you want panning gestures and things, you can turn that on. Uh, it's one thing you can set. Uh, selection, this is the same selection options in ArcMap, for the interactive selection, remember that. Editing, so this gets to the question about autosave. So we first off have some editing, so dynamic constraints. That's where as you move your mouse, it'll show you from the last point where you clicked what angle and distance you've moved. So again, if you like that, it's another CAD-like function. AutoCAD does that a lot. 
uh, in there. You want to double click to finish the sketch. Uh, if you are using a touch screen, you can you check this box here and allow you to use the screen. So if you have a stylus or something you want to use, uh, you can do that. There is an editor toolbar. Um, I'll show it to you in a second, but everybody remember or everybody know what the feature construction toolbar is? That one that follows your mouse around? I've heard it called the stalker toolbar. And a lot of times it gets in the way you just turn it off and... Well, what they've done in Pro is they, they still have it. It's what they call this, this editing toolbar, but it's locked. So you can control where it is. It's either the left, the right, or the bottom. I don't know why they won't let you put it at the top, but they won't. Uh, and then you can make it big or small or large, right? So you can control it or you can turn it off altogether if you still don't want to use it. But it, it's there. It's not always going to be getting in your way like the, the stalker toolbar did in ArcMap. Okay? Um, and then we're going to get down here to session. Remember I said there is no starting and stopping editing. There is still a separate save, though, for edits. So that still that need to go and save edits is there. So if you don't save and you've goofed, you can always discard those edits. Okay? But we now also have an autosave. So you can enable an autosave so that every so many operations or so many, is it minutes? Yeah, minutes up there, it automatically will save your edits. Something a lot of folks have been asking for for a long time to get in there. Um, the downfall of that is if we don't have to start and stop editing and we're always in an edit session, Invariably, <laughs> this is what would happen to me anyway, is if I go with the default at, at 10 minutes, at 9 minutes and 45 seconds, I'm going to act it goof. And I'm going to go, oh, I just goofed. Oh, I need to make sure I undo that. Right as you go to undo it, it saves. And you're going to go, oh my God. And then you can't undo because it's saved. So our Pro is still like that. If you save, your changes, save your edits, there's no undo. That hasn't changed. Now, there is, you'll notice down below that, uh, it says show dialog to confirm save edit. So even though it auto saves, it's still going to pop up a, a are you sure window. Right? So you can cancel that. The problem is, if you set auto save to, to 10 minutes, or some people are like terrified of losing any work, so they'll set it down to like every minute. Right? And I've seen this in AutoCAD. Okay. And then, so every minute that window, are you sure, is going to be popping up. And they go, oh my God, this is driving me nuts. I'm going to turn that off because you can. There's a checkbox. So you turn that off, then your safety net's really gone. So be aware of that. I'm not saying don't use the autosave because new users coming in are used to everything else autosaving. But you have to kind of think through how that process is going to work before you transition over. Uh, just, there's also where you can discard ed edits, which is the equivalent of stopping editing and not saving, right? Again, so there's a confirm. Are you sure you want to discard? Because it discards all edits. It doesn't just go back one. It goes, everything that's not been saved, you discard, right? So keep, keep that in mind uh, as well. And all the versioning stuff, if you're doing SDE stuff, is still in there. That hasn't changed from ArcMap as well. So get through that. Uh, Display, this is something for your video card. So if you find that your system's crashing or it's having a hard time rendering it, you might want to go in and play with these settings. Turn on, say, hardware anti-aliasing. Again, it depends on your video card. I can't tell you exactly what to set this to. It's going to depend on your system. But if you find the video is not working correct, you may want to try some of these settings. Uh, one thing I do want to point out is the cache. So as I said, every map, every scene you pull up is cached. This is where it stores, and it'll tell you what it is. Mine is, is pretty small, 272 megabytes. That's small. I've seen, I've gotten up to over 20 gigabytes in cache. So you can go here, check this box, and it will clear it out if you need some more space, but do that manually. Let's see if there's anything else. Um, okay, so... Here's kind of an automated thing. If anybody pulls in CAD data, that's MicroStation or AutoCAD data, you check this box, and if you try to add a DWG or a DGN file or a DXF file, with this box checked, you add it, and then it immediately will convert it into a geodatabase. So what shows up in your map is geodatabase. So um, 
I'm a former CAD user, both AutoCAD MicroStation. I know how to extract data. I know how to I, I'd rather keep it in CAD and just pull out what I need. But if you've never worked in CAD and you don't understand, then that might be an option to consider checking. Puts it back into something you're comfortable with. Metadata standards, uh, item description, that hasn't changed. Indexing for your projects is in here. Uh, they do have, notice there is, I need to go here, proofing. So you can enable a spell check. This is for your layout only right now. But you can spell check your layout, pick a dictionary, put your own word list in and start hanging out with that. So that's kind of nice. Uh, customizing the ribbon. So the ribbon you see, you can create your own tabs and stuff within the ribbon. As well as up update the quick access toolbar, which is that little bitty toolbar that's up here. I'll show you in just a second. Control that. So those are some of the options that we've, we've looked at. Okay. I'll go back. Here, so this is that quick access toolbar. So this is where also you can open a project, create a new project, save your project. This is where your undo and redo buttons are. They're now up here. So they're not somewhere down here, not on toolbar anywhere, they're up here. A couple of things I also want to show you that I spent forever trying to find. Esri loves sharing. So printing is sharing. I must have spent 15 minutes trying to figure out how to print an art pro store. <laughs> but yeah, so printing is sharing. Exporting to PDF, JPEG is also sharing. Yeah, it's it, kind of the same process. But if you also want to create layer files, map files, project files, project packages, map packages, all of that's considered sharing too. So that's where you're going to find all of, all, all of that stuff. Now, those packages and web service, public, I get as sharing. I never really would have thought of printing or even exporting and sharing. Uh, also, with Pro, how many of y'all export to AI files from ArcMap? A couple of y'all do. Uh, you can't do that from Pro. The, what Esri has done is developed a plugin for Adobe Illustrator that they want you to use directly in Adobe Illustrator as opposed to going from Art Pro out to an AI file and then into Adobe Illustrator. So they, it's a free plugin too, it doesn't cost anything. So uh, that's the new workflow for that. You can bring in Excel, uh, it'll read in XLS, XLS, S, or X, whatever it is, tool uh, files. But just like ArcMap, they have to be formatted very specifically. It, it still doesn't like it. Um, they also have, and ArcMap has this too, a lot of folks may not be aware of this, but so if I go to Analysis tab in the ribbon, this is where I get to, to Toolbox. Right, so go to my Toolbox over here, it opens the Geoprocessing pane. If I go here to Tools, see if I can, I don't know how well y'all can see that. Um, under conversion tools, you'll see Excel. So these are two scripts that will uh, go to Excel or come from Excel. And if you have some problems bringing the in directly into ARC, then you may want to try one of these two scripts. They work pretty well. I've got some good results from problematic Excel files, getting them in. Because it actually converts it to a standalone table, be it DBF or in a standalone table in your geodatabase. So, um, what was that? Way back when, yeah. So, uh, some other things, a couple other gotcha. These ready to use tools right here on the, these are ArcGIS Online functionality. So, if I don't have a network analyst, I can still generate a service area or find a route using these tools. However, they all use credits. So anytime you use these tools, they're going to, and the, the number of credits it used depend on how many check boxes you put, you, you click in the tool. The more complex the analysis, the more credits it uses. So be aware of that. Also on the map tab here, there's also something called this infographics tool. Get just a second. Uh, this also uses credits to access basic demographic data, but it's like one one hundredth of a credit per use. So it, you'd have to really go haywire with it to eat up a bunch of 
of credits. But you can see I clicked here and I get uh, sp some basic demographic data, key facts, and, and I'm not a, a demographer, so I don't know what all this stuff is. Can you what? Yes, through, through the user, uh, through the ArcGIS Online administrative tools, you can limit each user's total credit allotment. So you can set it to zero, you can set it to unlimited, or you can say you only get 100. So yes, you can control how many credits each user gets. Yes? Mm -hmm. The if you're lev it depends on which tool you're leveraging. If you're using one of the Esri widgets in Web App Builder, probably not. If you build something using one of these ready to use tools um, here, then yes. Yeah, yeah, and um, geocoding, the default geocoder, you do one address, does it cost you credits, but if you use, the, use it to do batch processing, it's 100 credits per thousand addresses or something like that. that well, uh, <laughs> you, you just have to. Anything under ready to use uses credits. The infographics uses credits. Geocoding, if you use the Esri geocoding service, uses credits. If you use your own local service, it doesn't use credits. It, you're going to have to get accustomed to that whole what does and what doesn't use credits thing. It's just they don't immediately call it out to you. Yep, and you watch that, and there, if you're using the named user model, then you can control and see who's using credits and, and how many they're using, and then either throttle them back or give them more if they need to really do it. Yes? Well, um, no, if you just want, because what data stored in Arc Online, what you pay for is the storage, not the access, right? So, yeah, to edit, through my uh, catalog pane here. So this is like the catalog window in ArcMap. So first off, this is all the things in your project, right? So you can see the, the toolboxes, the databases, and all this. If you go over here to Portal, this is where you access your Arc Online content. So I can go to, here's my content, or here's the groups, or you know, here's all the Living Atlas and then everything, right? So I can access this from here. So any feature services that I've published I just drag and drop into the map, and I can edit them all day long. There's no nothing different. And like I said, I can edit data that's on a web service at the same time editing a local feature class on the geo and the shape all at the same time. Right? Yes, sir. It 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 works. Um, now I'm not sure about going directly through Portal, but through SDE, it, it supports full versioning, just like you've been doing in ArcMap. No, you do the save edits, and then it's still. As far as I know, yeah. I'll be honest. I haven't. I don't have SDE to test it with, but I'm pretty sure. Oh, post array. Well, you still you still have to do. It still has the the change tables, that, the delta tables in there that have to be post and reconciled. So it's that that basic workflow hasn't changed. They said when I went through those edit those options. Here down under the, where is it, the editing here. So you've got all, see, you still got these, I'm sorry, down here the same versioning options that you have to set up in ArcMap. So that, that, that basic workflow of post reconcile I, has not changed as far as I know. Yeah, you'd set, set all that up and then on your edit tools over here, this is where you get in and control the, the different ways, and then there's also this drop down here that gets you into all the different editing tools that are capable of in here. Now, Esri is trying to get away from versioned editing. 
uh, and trying to let you do use more, well, SDE version editing, I should say. They're trying to le leverage more of the direct database spatial tools for that kind of thing than and using more like views and things of that nature. So well, that just makes it, well, one, it allows you to leverage a lot of power out of the database itself because by using SDE and just strictly, then you're limited a lot on what you can do with the database tools. And there's a ton of great tools inside of SQL Server or Postgres that, that really can open up a lot more power and give it, allow you to distribute data so if somebody doesn't have to have GIS software, you can actually allow like somebody to just edit a table in that same data. Anyway, there's a lot of stuff that go on with that. But. Yeah, so you still have your feature template. So if I, again, I'm on the Edit Toolbar. If I click the Create button here, it opens the Create Features pane, and you would still have the same templates. Now, the nice thing here with Pro is that if you're, you make a change, you change symbology, you add a new editable layer, it automatically updates the templates. There's no having to manually add or stop editing, start editing to pick up the change. It just automatically picks them up. So it's pretty, pretty slick. Any other questions? Store relative path? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, not, not, not that I'm aware. I haven't seen. You can do, they want you to use UNC, which wouldn't be a relative path. Yes, the field the field calculator is always been in there, um, and but it also uses our can use Arcade and Python, and they in 2.2 they added the calculate geometry tool in there, so that's back that's in there now. Yes, sir. Yes, when you create a new project, you've got a project folder, a project file, a project database, and a, and a toolbox all that all get automatically generated in the project folder by default. Now, again, you can set it so it doesn't do that, that it automatically points to if you have one database that you're using for your organization, you can go through those options and set it to always point to that one database. So it doesn't create all that stuff every time you create a new project. So it's under, yes. It, it depends on what the, I mean, if it's, a, if it's an RDBMS, a SQL database connection, then you put in you know, you, that connection in there. If it is a, a file geo database, then yeah, you, you want to put in the UNC path to access that file geo. Which by the way, even a local machine has a UNC path. The slash slash local host slash, and then you actually have to go into Windows and share the, the, the folder or the drive to then create that path, but you can do that. So. Is that? Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, what you also can do is there's favorites. Over uh, here in the catalog, there's a favorites tab. So you can go ahead and establish those connections in the favorites. So any new project you open, you go there and just go add, add, add. Or you can also set it to automatically add to new projects from the favorites, too. That's another way to, to handle those connections. It's got to have a GDB. So property mapping, depending on how your data is set up, there is a traverse tool under editing, which is like the Kogo traverse tool in ArcMap. So you can still do that if you have those fields already set up. You can bring that in as long as you're not using the parcel fabric. If you're just using the, the Kogo tools, then yeah, the traverse tool brings it in. Uh, and some places don't even go that far. They just do the, I start here, right click, and go direction and distance, and that way, and... So yeah, the Traverse tool's there. You can start using it and it, it 
Yep. Yep. Um, they're going to have to be evaluated. They, they may come right, right across. They may have to be tweaked. They may have to be completely rewritten. It just depends on how they were created, what they're in, all that kind of stuff. Sure. Thank you all. By the way, I, I do teach ARC Pro classes out at ITRI at NC State, so oh, okay. we got some going on the next couple of weeks.